Hi, I'm Pat Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods. And I'm here to talk to the scientists and engineers of the world. If you're like me, you went into science because you love hard problems. And there's nothing more rewarding than working on the most challenging and important problems you can find. And this is it. Our mission at Impossible Foods is to completely replace the use of animals as a food production technology. And what that will accomplish is this. It will enable us to reverse the catastrophic collapse of global biodiversity, turn back the clock on climate change, and actually change the way Earth looks from space. To understand how it's possible, look at a movie of the burning Amazon. More than 90% of the Amazon deforestation is and has been driven by the demand for land for animal agriculture. Over the past 200 years, 45% of Earth's surface has been turned from its original natural state to animal agriculture. The difference in biomass on the land due to animal agriculture is equivalent to about 15 years worth of fossil fuel emissions. So what we're going to do effectively is take that movie of the burning Amazon and run it in reverse and do the same for the hypothetical movie of deforestation of all the other parts of the world that are now covered by cows. Does it bother you that in the Paris Climate Accord, representatives of countries around the world signed on to commitments that accept a 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global average temperatures? That is absolutely insane, completely unacceptable. And on top of that, today those countries aren't even keeping their feeble commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is not a job for politicians anymore. This is a job for science, and that is where you come in. You're probably thinking, I'm a brilliant scientist or engineer. Why would I ever want to go work at a food company? What kind of scientific and engineering challenges are there? Well, I, 10 years ago, I was exactly like you. I wasn't even thinking about this problem. I had the best job in the world. My job was literally just to come into work, try to discover and invent things, follow my curiosity wherever it leads me, and uh, help students learn how to do the same. And I absolutely loved it. It never remotely occurred to me to work at a company, much less a food company. I wasn't even interested in food. So I totally get it. Then I discovered the problem. And the problem is that the use of animals as a food production technology is by far the most destructive technology in human history. It's an environmental catastrophe. This problem is incredibly important for the world, but it's also incredibly challenging. It's the kind of problem, I would have thought it, it's the kind of problem that scientists and engineers love. We need to figure out how far more efficiently to take ingredients from plants and make foods that deliver everything that consumers value from meat, fish, and dairy foods more sustainably and affordably and healthier. And those foods, the properties of those foods, are just defined by the molecules that make them up and the way those molecules are assembled. But it's not a solved problem. It's not enough for us to make uh, meats that are just as good as the meat from an animal. That's not going to win in the marketplace. We have to make meat, fish, and dairy foods that outperform in deliciousness, nutrition, and value. That's a hard problem, but it's biochemistry, it's molecular biology, it's genomics, it's genetics, it's biophysics, it's material science. The things that people love about meat are all emergent properties of the molecular structure of beef. The flavor and aroma, the juiciness, the textures, those all come from biomolecules. Biomolecules, just like the biomolecules that make up any cell that you might be studying, but the particular molecules and the way they're spatially arranged and so forth has this emergent property that is the sensory pleasure of beef. Understanding how that works, this is really not categorically different than, for example, understanding how RNA transport works or how a biosynthetic pathway works. It's all those biochemical approaches, all those molecular biological approaches that you would use to study how living cells work. 
an interesting thing is that, you know, as a biologist, I mean, this is what I did. You're, what you're interested in is the kind of molecular mechanisms that underlie life. How does the living cell work? How does the, the living organism work in molecular terms? Now, when you talk about meat, it's funny, actually, those same molecules have a completely different function, okay? The function of myosin in meat has nothing to do with its behavior as a motor protein and how it makes muscles move or anything like that. It has to do with the kinds of materials it makes, the material properties it confers when it unfolds. The unfolding transition of myosin is actually an important part of the process by which when you cook meat, its texture changes from squishy to firm and it becomes juicy inside because it forms a gel that contracts and exudes the aqueous phase. So that's just one example, but it's all these things that, that we've studied for hundreds of years in the context of how do they make a cell work? Okay, we get a completely different view of them now. How do these molecules make food work? And just to illustrate how an unexplored a frontier it is, eight or nine years ago when we started working on this problem, one of the things we wanted to understand is, what's the mechanism that accounts for this explosion of flavor aroma when you cook meat? Well, it turns out that we discovered the answer. It's basically a molecule called heme, which if you're a biochemist, you know exactly what heme is. That molecule catalyzes this explosion of chemical reactions that transforms simple biomolecules like amino acids, vitamins, fats, simple sugars, into hundreds of volatile compounds that we've learned to recognize as the uh, flavor and aroma profile of meat. And yet, 10 years ago, nobody knew this because nobody bothered to look before. That's how unexplored this area is. Think of it this way. If you're a protein structural biologist, you're doing structure function studies, you're interested in how this enzyme works or this cytoskeletal protein works or whatever, you're studying the precisely folded structure of that protein and the things that it evolved to do. And you can take advantage of evolutionary conservation and so forth to kind of really distill out, you know, what are the essential features and use all those tools. Now, that same molecule may very well have an important role in food, in meat. It's a completely different role. And most likely, most of the proteins in the food we eat are unfolded, okay? Their structure is completely different from the structure we've studied to try to understand how they work in cells. And the properties that matter are not the same properties that mattered in vivo. Very often, intermolecular interactions between proteins that create a material with long range physical properties, mechanical properties, things that affect the interactions with water and fat and so forth. It's a completely new material defined by a phase change in those proteins into a phase that basically has hardly been studied at all. And it has important features that are important to its function, both the flavor chemistry and the texture at many levels of scale, from the molecular scale to the you know, micron scale, to the millimeter scale, to the centimeter scale, and of course, the global scale. So there are fundamental mechanisms still to be discovered about protein. You could say, well, if it's not the kind of thing that the protein evolved to do to keep the cell alive, why am I interested in it? Well, here's a good reason. We could save our planet by understanding that. Good enough for you? At Impossible Foods, we're inventing all the time. Even, for example, the uh, research instruments that we need to make the measurements and observations to guide our research, they're not available off the shelf. So we actually have uh, electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and robotics experts working to build novel gadgets quickly on the fly so that we can make measurements or control a process precisely uh, at the lab scale, that's never been done before, okay? And then that's, that's kind of like the gadgeteering kind of invention. Of course, we're, we're inventing a whole new system for producing foods. There's plenty of other inventive things. Then we need to do the same thing on a large scale. 
So here's an engineering challenge. Suppose we were to say that actually a, um, a big part of the protein source for the future human diet is proteins extracted from leaves. Well, for one thing, about, one thing about those proteins I think that's important to realize is that unlike seed storage proteins, the proteins, the major proteins in leaves, are highly evolutionarily conserved. So that creates the possibility that we could isolate proteins that are functionally interchangeable from dozens or hundreds of different plant sources. It, it means that we can be much less dependent on a small number of crops as components of raw materials for, for the human diet. That's great for food security. We have plenty of ideas and plenty of important problems. But if you can think of things that we haven't thought of, and I'm sure there are a lot of uh, people watching this that can and maybe are already thinking about how they can do better, that's what we want. What we want is to bring in great scientific and engineering minds and not tell them what to do. We'll, we want to bring you in and tell you this is the big problem we need to solve and effectively say, okay, here's the things we're doing already. Here's the things that we know already. What can you think of to do? And here's another fun aspect of it. When we're done in 2035, you can look at a satellite picture of Earth and compare it to a satellite picture from today and say, I did that. It looks completely different.